Good afternoon. I'm here as the idea generator. Your title is actually the idea spreader. So my challenge is to communicate to you the ideas we're thinking of to see if you can actually share those ideas. But first, let's talk about what that idea is. Because if we don't have a clear idea together, that communication won't happen. So let's go to this aspect of reading. Why is reading important? Well, do you know that we have 36 million adults in the United States today who struggle with literacy? Do you know that we have about 15 million children under the age of 18 who also struggle with literacy? Do you know that if you have a family history of learning problems, you have a greater chance of having learning problems as well? We now know today that if you enter school with a higher risk, you're gonna struggle more. We know that if you don't read on grade level by fourth grade, 40% of those children are going to be on welfare at some point in time. We know that there's data that says, when you look at the juvenile justice system, and we ask about the children in that system, what percentage of those children have history of learning disabilities? It's approximately 80%. We look at the high school dropout population. What percentage of high school students who drop out of high school have learning disabilities? It's about 80%. When you look at the prison, and we say individuals who've made some poor choices ended up breaking some laws are now in our prison system and we're spending tens of thousands of dollars per year to house them in these prisons. What's the incidence of learning disabilities? It's anywhere from 50 to 80%. But here's the most alarming statistic. Our number one killer of teenagers is suicide. And when they leave notes and somebody analyzes the actual notes that they wrote as a suicide note, 80% of those suicide notes are full of spelling mistakes. So maybe that was just an added pressure that they didn't need. So what if somebody studied how reading works and we understand that you have to be able to sound out words? What if we understand that you actually also have to be able to memorize words? That's part of our reading skills. What if we know the other skill you have to have is be able to understand the vocabulary of what you're reading? What if scientists understood that when that happens, you actually are more likely to read fluently with more ease, less difficulty, and when that's happening, what if we have science that tells us you're more likely to actually understand the information that you're reading? Would that begin to challenge your idea of what dyslexia and learning disabilities are? But our key piece is knowing that we have to first be able to sound out those words. So what if science helped us understand that different parts of the brain do different things? Some parts are actually involved in speech skills. Some parts are involved in auditory processing skills. Some are in listening and learning skills. But what if we actually knew even more than that? What if somebody had actually studied that the brain's actually a big network? And the activities you do are what we call experience-based plasticity. It means if I give you the practice, you begin to build these networks. That's where the skills come from. That's what learning really is. And we understood that there's networks for syntax or word order. There's networks for semantics of vocabulary. There's networks for the sound structure of our language. And these networks need to develop to build these skills. And it happens actually in a hierarchy. What if somebody actually had understood, studied, that phonology, because hopefully you're talking to the child as soon as they're born, and you're giving them some language exposure, phonology is one of our earliest developing systems. Shortly thereafter is semantics. Shortly after that is syntax word orders. Later on comes reading and spelling. There's not one language in the world that you read and spell it first and speak it later. Language starts with speech first. And if you're weak at these foundational skills down here, you're at risk for struggling at these higher level skills up here. And then we have the last set of skills, those writing and those metalinguistic skills. What if we actually understood how this model worked? Would that change your view of what dyslexia is and the idea that we actually might be able to do more about it? But come back to this phonology piece. What if somebody had actually studied this even in more detail? What if we could say to you, phonology is actually part or motor skills. Can you move your mouth to say the sounds that actually are part of our language? Do you actually have the awareness of how your mouth is moving when you make these sounds? For example, when you say the sound for a B, B, your lips have to come together, they have to pop apart. Do you have that awareness of how your mouth is working? Or this letter D, which commonly kids mix up, B's and D's. But what if you understood that when you make the sound for a D and you say, duh, your tongue always has to go up in front and come back down. What if you really understood how that motor system goes along as part of this phonology? And then you have the acoustics. You can hear the sounds. And there's visual as well. What if, for example, you had trouble, trouble understanding if I said free or three, as opposed to saying free or three? 
that visual symbol might actually play a part in this whole development of this phonological system. What if science understood this? Would that change your idea of what reading really is and what we might be able to do about it to help more people have functional reading skills? We know one of those skills is that phonological system. One is actually memorizing sight words. One is being able to say the words. One is actually being able to use pitch and tone to communicate interesting meaning. One is actually the morphosyntactic or those little small parts that change meaning of words. And these systems together, if they're all equally strong, they're green lights. The information's flowing, could actually build really solid reading skills. Would that science help change your idea of what reading really is and what we can do about it? What if somebody actually even studied the brain activity patterns in kids who read well? And we found out that typically the left side of the brain is more active when you're reading and reading really well and the right side's not so active. But what if somebody studied even more and they actually looked at the brain of someone who actually had dyslexia or poor reading skills and they actually found out that the left side was not very active in this child or this adult. The right side's doing most of the work but yet their performance on reading testing is not very good. Will that make you consider that maybe we know more about dyslexia than you're aware of? What if someone actually even studied people after they died and looked at the structure of their brain to say was there actually something physically different about the brain structure? And the answer came back of yes, but not all over, just in very specific areas. Oh, and by the way, these just happen to be all those areas that are really important for language. Those auditory processing areas, those mouth movement skill areas, that awareness of the mouth movement areas, whether your lips are popping, your tongue is tapping, that motor control to actually speak. What if we really understood that that might be a factor in dyslexia and learning difficulties? Would that change your idea of what this is and what we might be able to do about it? What if somebody actually knew that before you were born, you already had a genetic predisposition for dyslexia and it actually affected how your brain organized itself? Each of these neurons, you have 100 billion of them, has to get to a certain part of the brain. It's got to travel to a certain layer. And what if somebody actually took pictures to prove that maybe this didn't happen properly before the sixth month of gestation, before you were even born? You had a predisposition that language and learning might be harder for you. And they actually even had images, high resolution images to say, here's the brain tissue here where all those neurons are, all those brain cells are. But some of them didn't stop there. They went too far up. They went to an area they're not supposed to be. And now we've created noise in the system. It's going to be a less efficiently wired language system, which means it may take more work to build those networks. Would that change your idea of what dyslexia and learning difficulties really are? What if someone gave you the big picture of this? They said, okay, yeah, we think it's genetic. It influences the organization of the left side of the brain, which may influence the efficiency of how well you develop these phonological skills, which could also influence your ability to learn the sounds and letters which could also influence how much you struggle in learning to read and whether or not you ever really become fully competent in reading. Would that change your idea of what dyslexia is and what we might do about it? What if we knew that in a special ed placement, we have IEPs, we have special ed schools, we have very dedicated teachers, but the data says that typically even in 16 months of special ed instruction, your reading and comprehension skills really aren't changing much. But what if somebody, a group of scientists did a study and actually showed in two months time with a little bit of very hierarchically designed, scientifically based instruction, we could change those skills dramatically. And not only change those skills in two months, but we brought you back a year later and your skills were even stronger and you'd had no more intervention. And we brought you back two years later and your skills were even stronger. Would that change your idea of what we can do to help children and adults who struggle with reading? But what if we actually showed you that one of the most important skills was how well you could sound out words? And we gave a test as scientists that measure your ability to, to sound out words that are not real, words like throig, plish, spliggerty. The only way you can read them is you have to sound them out. And if you did it, and we actually took you from the lowest of percentages of your classroom, and in two months time, we put you smack dab in the average range. And we brought you back one year later, and your skills had held. They didn't drop all the way back to before. And then two years later, they're starting to climb again. Would that change your idea of what might be possible to help children and adults with learning disabilities? What if we could actually even prevent this problem? What if we did not have to wait until there was failure? What if we could actually know how to early screen, early identify with so much success that we only missed 2.4% of the kids who are at the highest risk? Will that change your idea of what might be possible? When we showed you that no matter we give you no treatment as a five-year-old 
or we give you some little extra one-on-one time as a five-year-old, or we gave you some one-on-one phonics instruction as a five-year-old, and no matter which of those three we did, that 25 to 40% of these kids who came to kindergarten in those lower percentages, highest risk, actually did not pass kindergarten or first grade. But if we used a scientific developmental approach, we had 91% pass kindergarten or first grade. And then when we looked at these kids at the end of second grade, their reading accuracy and reading fluency is smack dab in the average range. What if we actually prevented these kids from ever having to need special ed services and protected their belief in themselves, did not challenge their belief about whether or not they're intelligent? It's hard to think you're intelligent when you struggle to read and the kid next to you does not. What if we brought you back at fourth grade and your skills were stronger still? What if we actually could prevent and keep you from actually having to struggle with difficulty? And what if somebody actually measured it? What if another scientific group said, let's see how the brain changes? Because let's see if there's some challenging things we can learn from this. Because now we see the right side was active before intervention, but after intervention for the same child, it's not the right side that's more active, it's the left. Just like the kids who didn't have learning trouble. Could we actually have rewired the brain and that rewiring shows us new activity and shows us more performance? Here's another child. Right side was more active before treatment, but now the left side's more active after treatment and their reading skills are much stronger, just like a child who didn't struggle to learn how to read. What if there's actually another scientific group that even measures the fibers that connect the parts of the brain? That's like the phone lines that allow the brain to communicate with each other. And we could actually even measure how those phone lines changed over time. Would that convince you to challenge your idea of what dyslexia is and what we might be able to do about it? What if we actually even knew to actually build these networks, build these phone lines, that we needed some key elements? We needed intensity of practice, how many hours per day? We needed frequency of instruction, how many days per week? And the more of each, the better we're gonna get those networks going. The more specificity of the instructional method, it needs explicit methods, the more developmental hierarchy that goes with it as well, and the right duration. Rarely would you ever tell your pediatrician, you know what, you told me I need to take the antibiotic for 10 days, I think I could do it in five. But if we know the duration, we know how to prescribe it, maybe we can actually be more successful in the school setting as well. So then, would that be enough information to make you challenge some beliefs of every child learns differently? Maybe they don't learn differently. Maybe that's just been a product of the way we have approached the instruction. Would that challenge your belief that somehow reading just clicks for kids? We don't quite know how it happens, but sooner or later they're gonna get it, but yet the data says it doesn't. Would that challenge your belief that we need to randomly try things to see what's gonna work? Which strategy, because we really don't know the system, let's just randomly try things. Would that challenge your belief that we need to keep doing that or we could actually do more? And what about this question of no one reading program works for all kids? Why not? Why couldn't we achieve that? We typically say take the same approach for kids who don't have reading problems. Why wouldn't we be able to do that with kids who are higher risk and do struggle if we know what to do to build those foundational skills, make those processing skills stronger, and build those higher networks? And would that challenge your belief that one or two times a week is better than nothing? Because maybe it's not. Maybe the growth that you're making for that child is so small, and his class is getting farther away, that he never actually quite ever catches up. But yet, if we could change this part of it too, that might be one of the pieces of the recipe for success. And would that challenge your belief that maybe some students never learn to sound out words and we're just gonna have you memorize as many as possible? In the audience today, it's one in five of you that had this struggle. One in five of you who are now adults may still have this same struggle. But the good news is, this rewiring that this helps happen, helps take place, is age limitless. It means as long as you're alive, your brain can still make new connections. That's okay, that's good news for all of us. So if we can challenge these notions, if I can plant that idea in your head and you can consider this, what's it gonna take for you to change that idea? How much information do you have to have? How much data do we have to put together before we really systematically change these systems and help prevent learning difficulties and the struggles that can contribute to so many other problems for kids in their lifetime? So for, sorry, for schools, to nearly teach all children to read at or above grade level, we're gonna have to start mixing the oil of science with the water of education. The two are gonna have to start coming together. Science has provided the data, can you consider it? Is it even possible that what we just showed you might challenge your beliefs and you have a different view on what we can do? And if we incorporate science and educational practices, then maybe the 10 to 20% of students who are high risk for poor reading, the 10 to 20% who might 
uh, or sorry, the 80% who are in juvenile justice with reading problems, the 80% of the high school dropouts, the kids who have suicide, the people end up in prison. Maybe I have the idea and you could spread that idea that we could actually change those outcomes. Mixing oil and water, is it worth it? My statement is, our students' futures depend on it. Thanks. Thank you.